everyone. Welcome to our first ever Toxic Concept Bureau. This is going to be a regular series where we bring in the people that inspire us from all over the world, from all over the spectrum of expertise, and have them teach us something new, either about culture or about our future, in a way that we can apply to brand strategy. And today we have Peter Spear, who is a friend of mine, someone that I've followed for a very long time, who I deeply admire, and I'll let him share his background. But for me, Peter is an extremely talented ethnographer. He's an incredible brand thinker. He has one of my favorite newsletters in the space that we'll link to in the description for this episode. And I just really love the way that he looks at people. When I see people through Peter's eyes, I feel like I always learn something new that I hadn't thought about before. I feel like some small part of the human experience or the human mystery is solved. And I'm very grateful that we have him here today with us. And so with that, I will hand it over to Peter. Nice. Thank you so much for those kind words. I really appreciate it. And the invitation to give this talk, it was a real opportunity for me to dive into some of these ideas that I really love. And I really went for it, I think. So I'm a little nervous. And I hope you guys sort of play along with me as we play around with some ideas. Let's see. So let me, I'm going to share my screen. I want to make sure you guys can all see that. Perfect. All right. So I'm going to talk to you about brand listening which is my way of talking about my approach to qualitative research. I learned uh, kind of late in life that I'm a people person. I never really wanted to take anything apart and put it back together again. I wanted to watch people and I wanted to ask them questions. And I, I guess that maybe you guys are like that too. And this slide really just gives you a sense of some of the brands that I've worked with and some images of the people I've done ethnographies with in the middle Lisa Sleep, which is a bed in the box company, which I'll talk about later. And on the right, fitness for TB12, the Tom Brady brand. I went and worked out with people. And most recently, I did a project for Lundberg Family Farms. And on the left, you'll see this palace project. That's a name and identity that we developed. And I also share that story. So I want to talk to you about brand listening, and I'm going to do it in two ways. One, I'm going to play around with some big ideas and sort of share the guiding beliefs that are sort of ground my work. Um, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about what I've learned about the interview, what it means to be an interviewer, how to ask questions, all that stuff. And I think ultimately what we do is we try to make a link between a very human interaction in an interview and changes in culture. And so I think ultimately that's what I hope to inspire. I asked you some questions last week and I really appreciated your responses. And so my hope is that after I share all this stuff that you guys can be confident in your curiosity. I think that's our superpower that we can um, learn how to ask better questions because they come from this place of wonder, which will allow us to create kind of intimacy in the interview process and we'll just be more effective interviewers. And that will eventually power more beautiful brands, which I think is something that maybe we all want. So <clears throat> practically speaking, when I say brand listening, I'm talking about the combination of two methodologies, ethnographic observation on one hand and imaginative conversation on the other. Daniel Kahneman, he said that we have two selves, that there's the experiencing self and there's the remembering self. And I think it's just lucky that brand listening falls right on top of those. And I called it brand listening because I learned it like you guys in a brand consulting context. So qualitative was always feeding strategy. When I went out on my own as a qualitative researcher, I was in the sort of the moderator's gutter and qualitative isn't always honored in that space. And I wanted to elevate my own practice and I wanted to elevate qualitative in general, which you guys also acknowledged. And I appreciate that a lot, the desire for qualitative to be taken more seriously. So a few things I feel like I've learned over the years is that we live in a culture. I love this image that kind of wants to be a machine when it grows up. And I think this is true. You know, like, I think we get a lot of, we get giddy about things that get us closer to machines. We can see this now in AI. And this means that qualitative has a hard go of it because it's just not appealing. <laughs> it's not appealing to the machine and it's hard to digest. 
I think also decision makers are drowning in passive data and easy surveys that give them answers. And qualitative doesn't always give answers, it gives understanding. And I think there's a real qualitative illiteracy in leadership. So these are all kind of factors that I think work against qual. And I really uh, want very much to champion qualitative and make it a hero. So the structure of the rest of the talk is going to be these four ideas that inform brand listening. And I'll go through them briefly here. The first is that every brand is a tool for self-creation and that it's self-creation, not self-interest that drives the market. So I provocatively state it. And that it's this transformation or this aspiration for transformation that's at the center of every interview or every inquiry. And that people have experiences, not answers. And that has real implications for who we are in an interview and, and how we ask questions. And finally, that the mind thinks in images. And I really want to make a case for creative, playful, imaginative, free association, projective techniques that access this particular wisdom, really. And so those are the four. We'll take them in turn. When Jasmine asked me to do this talk and I accepted, I thought, well, what's the craziest thing I could say? And, and can I think about that with my clients too? I don't use crazy. I think about the word provocative. I love the word provocative. It means to call forth. So I thought, what's the most provocative thing that I could say? And what came to me was that brands are myths and they work like myths. What would happen if I tried to think about brands through the framework of mythology? And so I dug around Joseph Campbell's stuff. I've listened to him, his lectures for years. I imagine all of you know who he is. There's more to him than the monomyth or the hero's journey. And I love this quote, that a ritual is the enactment of a myth and participating in a ritual is a way of participating in a myth. And I feel like you can lay that right down on top of brand and product experience and maybe elevate the kind of conversation we have about what's happening. So as an experiment, I'm going to play along with what happens when we apply what he says about myth to brands. He says that brands perform four functions. There's the mystical, there's the cosmological, the sociological, and the psychological. And they all, it's like from the universe to the world, to the society, to the individual life. And what he says about myth is that the development, this is a quote, of new mythic narratives in the age of science, when the old myths died and lost their power, is creative mythology. And the need for creative mythology occurs because for myth to fulfill its four functions, it's necessary that the myth be current with the science of the time. And I feel like that's almost a definition of brand management. Campbell was really, he was really into Jung, but he didn't believe in therapy. He thought that if a society had myths that adequately fulfilled all these functions, we would all be perfectly well-balanced, developed adults. And so he had a lot of faith in the power of myth to help us live our life without trouble. So we'll take them each in turn. The first is the mystical, which he says is uh, realizing what a wonder the universe is, what a wonder you are, and experiencing all before the mystery. I sometimes wonder if it's even appropriate to talk about brands at this level, but I thought it would be fun. And what came to me when I asked, when I was thinking about have I had any experience that come that is like awe from a brand? I remember being on my couch in 2012 when Felix Baumgartner just threw himself out of that little rocket shuttle and fell 24 miles in front of 8 million people live streaming on YouTube. I think it was my first experience of a live stream. And the fact that I was experiencing an event a live event of that magnitude on my couch in my hand was like, it just blew my mind. He has a great, almost moon landing quote. He said, sometimes you have to go up to understand how small you are. I'm coming home now. And so that was my thought about a brand, maybe delivering me an experience of awe. And then this, I saw this this week in the Wall Street Journal, but that recent study says 33% of 18 to 25 year olds say that they believe more than doubt in the existence of a higher power. And that's up from 25% just two years ago. And so we know that the need is there for this connection, for this feeling of being a part of something bigger and it's growing. And they attribute it to, of course, the pandemic and all the tensions that have been happening. So I included that there too. 
The second function is the cosmological, which sort of operates at the functions at the, the scale of the world, grasping the mystery by offering an explanation. I use Neil deGrasse Tyson as a stand-in for science. So this is the role that science plays. Like the Big Bang is our cosmological myth as to the origins of everything for us. That's what keeps us in place and comforts us. And so I asked myself, is there anything like a Big Bang story that a brand has ever launched? And I couldn't help but think about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency as kind of a Big Bang story for the origin of a totally different financial universe based on liberation and a totally mysterious technology, code, as a matter of fact. And so I thought, okay, Bitcoin might be doing something cosmological. The third function of myth is that at the level of society, sociological, this is, we are definitely now, I think we've come out of the atmosphere. And now I think we're in the realm of brand marketing. We're talking about law and order and social organization and social permission and behaviors. Social orders don't age well. Culture pushes and pulls. Beliefs change. Myths lose relevance. They get challenged. I think this function is about the kind of the range of possibilities that any society kind of allows and who gets to say what's possible. I think this is social mission. This is that question that an organization has as to whether they're going to take responsibility uh, for the impact that the category has on culture. That's how I define that. Many people call this brand purpose. I, I don't think that's true. I think that's inaccurate. I think, as you'll see with the next function, brand purpose is separate. As some examples, I thought I would, I don't know how many of you know Axe before they kind of grew up, but man, when they came out, they were, the Axe effect promised young men that if they wore their product, women would want to take their clothes off. It proved so effective, it backfired, I read in one piece, that middle schools and high schools started to reek. And, and so it sort of was damaging the brand. And I read one academic study that demonstrated that the Axe effect actually existed, that it made young men feel more confident. And it demonstrated that women also found those men more attractive. But of course, it was narrow, it was misogynistic, it was horrible. And times changed and the brand needed a new myth. It needed to assume responsibility for the sociological function of its brand. And it did so with a campaign called, Is It Okay for a Guy To? And it literally was just, it showed like the Google drop down. Is it okay for a guy to wear pink? Is it, okay, is it okay for a guy to kiss another guy? Is it okay for a guy to have long hair? And I thought I would show, it's cool to see Adweek responding to the change in the Axe brand behavior. Never thought we'd see this, but an Axe ad that has two men kissing. So aggressively heteronormative was their initial brand positioning. So this is a perfect example of the sociological function at work in a brand. So this demonstrates for me, brands work as myths, at least according to the sociological function. My second more, this one gets me a little fired up. Second example I wanna share, this is a, I love this image number one, but it's from the New York Times and it's a, it's a beautiful photo. The New York Times did not spend any money on brand for the 10 years leading up to 2016 when they hired Droga5. They had a new CMO that had come from Pinterest, David Rubin. So from 2006 to 2016, this meant that the role that journalism plays in a liberal democracy was essentially undefended. And they believed that their, the value of their product did not need defending, that the value of journalism was self-evident. I think this is a cultural issue with news organizations and not-for-profit that sort of just, they get squeamish about brand, they get squeamish about the idea of marketing, and they just didn't want to participate in culture. Uh, and so I wonder if they had spent 10 years assuming the responsibility for the sociological function of myth to educate us as to the value of journalism in a democracy, if an accusation of fake news would stick. My sense is maybe it would, but maybe it wouldn't in the same way at least. So they're, now they're in the game in their brand marketing. The last final function is called the psychological function. It's also called the pedagogical function, which I think, you know, which gets to the teacher of children. Campbell goes so far as to call mythology the second womb. And there's a beautiful quote here. He says, marsupial babies, they grow in a second womb. This is too funny. A womb with a view. 
We need mythology as the marsupial needs the pouch to develop beyond the stage of the incompetent infant to a stage where it can step out of the pouch and say, me, voila, I'm it. You can get Campbell's humor. If you ever have a chance to watch him lecture or listen to him lecture, he's pretty hilarious. So I think this function really is brand purpose. We're talking about a brand assuming responsibility for demonstrating how a category is done today. And I'm stealing that from John Grant. I think he used to say, the question really is, how is it done today? And the answer is, this is how it is done today. And I want to take a minute. I don't know if you're familiar with Grant McCracken, but I just read his ebook called The Gravity Well Effect. I don't think anybody writes with more electricity about culture than he does. And this Gravity Well Effect ebook, it's on Amazon. It's amazing. I'm going to read a little bit of it because he's diagnosing. He basically is saying, our culture is broken. And I mean this in a technical sense. This leaves us with a chronic condition of disorder and the consequences are terrifying. That's an unquote. And he's talking about since the 80s, cultures just keep fragmenting and fragmenting and fragmenting. The rites of passage and rituals are damaged. He talks about 7 million young men who are deemed failed to launch. So we're not, culture isn't helping young men grow to adulthood. And he, for him, he says that culture used to explain why things stay the same. Now culture explains why they changed. Culture is a source of chaos, not order. And I feel like this speaks directly to this idea of the, this pedagogical function. And he describes these gravity wells, which are little problem-solving solutions, pieces of culture that take chaos and turn it into order. And he explores sneaker culture, the artisanal revolution, and Mr. Beast through that lens. It's so good. So the pedagogical function, I think there are really very, very few, I'd love to hear your thoughts, examples of really well-constructed brands that do this very well. And I think we feel them when we encounter them. They feel different. Airbnb is absolutely the poster child for this. And I think this really is brand building as creative mythology. When a brand takes responsibility for modeling how the category is done in a way that helps the individual become who they want to become. I just saw this yesterday on LinkedIn that Airbnb changed their marketing from performance focus to brand focus two years ago. And they're the only public VC backed company founded in the U S in the last 15 years that is meaningfully profitable. And the list of brands who might be beautiful brands or not profitable is pretty astounding. So I love Airbnb as a case study for this. And they organized around that idea of belonging and they've kept moving the product story forward. I didn't dig around really hard looking for what's another great brand, but Tracksmith came to mind and it just felt like a really well-constructed brand. There's something almost invisible about what they're doing. It just feels really easy. It just feels like how it's supposed to be. This is what a running brand, a running culture, a running community would look like today. It just feels very natural. It doesn't effortless, really. And then I also really love Pinterest as a brand that seems like they have a very distinct transformation. They own a very distinct transformation in social media. They feel like they know who they are and they do it really well. So I think about them too, as an example. The second idea is self-transformation. And no matter what the client says in terms of the objective, my objective as the researcher is always to understand what's happening. What's the transformation at work? What's the core category benefit? It's understanding what the category is about, who the consumer wants to become. We know that this transformation is important because brands, sometimes they become verbs, which is crazy. Xerox, Airbnb, Uber, Venmo, they become verbs. Not every brand will become a verb, but because some do, it reveals how memory works and how language works, and it reveals how brand works. Now, Google, this is their homepage in 1998, I think when they launched, Google became a verb because they did this when everybody else was doing this. Uh, and I'm old enough to have done research for Alta Vista, the portal company demonstrated here. And we made the observation that somebody's going to own search and they'll take it because this was people's first experience of the internet. They would show up and have that page. So Google became a verb because they owned a singular transformation, which was search. Adam Morgan of Eat Big Fish, he talks about this competition to be the agent of self-transformation, to own a category as like a knife fight in a phone booth. Violence, maybe more violent than I'd like it to be, but I always like it because it's impactful. The third idea, 
was this was like the first thing I think I was taught and the hardest one to learn because I think it speaks to what it means to be an interviewer and how to ask questions. And it really talks to that moment of interaction with, with the participant. So I also read recently that anthropology is an explication. And I looked up the word explication because I didn't know what it mean, meant. And what it means is it's the act of unfolding or opening. And I think that's a beautiful way of thinking about my role as an interviewer is to really just get descriptions, get thick data, try to help things unfold. I'm going to share a clip of a therapist who is talking about her, how she teaches other therapists to ask questions. And her name is Harlene Anderson. And I just think what she says is really beautiful. So sometimes people ask, or often, particularly therapists who are new or new to these ideas will ask, well, if you don't know, then how do you know which questions to ask? Because most people are trained, and I certainly was early on trained from a psychodynamic perspective, that you come into the therapy room with your toolbox full of questions, either specific questions or type of questions that you should ask. And certainly in the family therapy field, it's been very popular to kind of have typologies of questions. And so we say, well, if we, we don't know, how in the world could we know what to ask another person before they start speaking and before they say something that we could be curious about. So Harry and I began to talk about and write about what we named conversational questions, not referring to particular type or kind of question, but a question that's informed by the conversation itself, by the story that you're listening to. That if you really are trying to pay attention to the story a person's telling, you're really interested in learning about it, you listen to it differently and you ask different kinds of questions than you would if you think you know already the story to be told and certainly if you think you know the story to be retold and what the more correct or proper or relevant or useful ending or resolution of the story new ending i guess i should say we're beginning of the story should be remote. so it's so not knowing has a lot to do with with questions and what you're what you're curious about. I will also think in terms of questions not being asked to be answered, but that questions are posed as a way of participating in the conversation. And how can your questions be close to the congruent with the responses that you're receiving from the other person? And how can you always pay careful attention to their responses to you? I just think that's the coolest thing I've ever heard. I get really excited by her articulation of that. Um, so I really love what she says that, of course, we come in with a discussion guide and there are questions and frameworks and structures that we have when we to structure the interview. But that idea that you can get into a place where I realize that I have to open myself up to what's happening right then and have to be with the person and find out what I'm curious about and that something happens in that moment that's different than asking questions to be answered. So I return to that video a lot and I share it a lot. On this question of experience, I don't think this is particularly novel, but I do think that interviews and guides always have these four layers active within them. There's the brand, there's the product, there's the category as expressed in the motivations, and then there's emerging cultural meanings. And I'm just going to walk you through sort of experiences and examples for each. Um, I was the qualitative partner on the, the launch of G-Series. I did some of the discovery stuff and the innovation stuff, but all the rebrand and the packaging and all that stuff I did. And so what I learned is that the product is the story that we tell ourselves and we tell others to justify the relationship that we want to have with the brand. And so product and brand are connected. And Gatorade at this time, they had a product story problem no athlete could defend choosing Gatorade over all the much more sophisticated functional beverages and nutritional supplements and sports nutrition that had come up and GNC and all this other stuff. And it's, this is straight out of Campbell. They needed a new mythic narrative that kept up with the science of the time. And so these products essentially were developed to demonstrate that the core product was contemporary and represented the science of the day and they rebranded around it. So the brand is the promise and the product is to deliver on the promise. I was taught that people have relationships with brands 
not with products. And that relationship really sets the expectations and it shapes the experience of the product. I love this story of Kraft Mac and Cheese in 2016. They had the exact opposite problem of Gatorade. The consumer had no problem with the product. They had a problem with the product in that they needed to re replace artificial ingredients with natural ingredients. And they chose, and they knew that it, they did not want to give anybody the opportunity to doubt the brand. So they made the change without telling anybody. And so they launched a whole reformulated mac and cheese product onto the market with no announcement whatsoever so that everybody would have a product experience of the new product without having given them any opportunity to doubt the brand. So they preserved the brand relationship by not telling them they were changing the product. The category, core consumer motivations, I did a project, this is a project for Nutribowl. C4s was the, it was at the time, it was, this is 2020, the fastest growing energy drink in the market came out of the fitness world and they wanted to understand how young people were thinking about energy differently. And so this was an exploration of energy and it was also an exploration of optimization. Well, how are young people approaching personal development and energy? So what I heard people talking about is an energy totally different than Red Bull and Monster. It was in totally different ideas about performance. There was conversations about emotional well-being. And most interesting for me, there was mental performance and there was a real need for social performance. And the core category benefit that I ended up articulating was this idea of brilliance, that we really, what energy was today was this way of shining, that we all wanted to sort of shine our best self out into the world to radiate, to be able to express ourselves so we could be seen in this social performance with screens and social media and Zoom and heard and resonate. I created a framework of self-optimization that included four different sort of metaphors for the kinds of transformations people were seeking from energy. And then finally, culture. I think those first three are kind of like a, they're like on a ship and that ship is on an ocean of culture. And that when I am working on a project, I'm always trying to understand how are these definitions changing and how have they changed? And sometimes it's as easy as asking a respondent, what would your parents say? How is it different today than it was for your parents? To try to get into conversations about what shift. And so Lisa Sleep, I showed those pictures before. They're a bed in a box company. I did in-home interviews with people, couples and in their home and in their bedrooms. And what I learned from in terms of emerging cultural meetings was that in the age of screens, the bedroom had really become the sort of last bastion of connection. And the, the bed, if the kitchen is the social center of the home, the bedroom is kind of the emotional center of the home. It's the only place that nobody's distracted. And there's moments of real intimacy with the whole family and with kids that definitely didn't happen a generation ago when the master bedroom was kind of off limits. There was also the core transformation there was about rest, which is something that we all know exists, but we never get <laughs> and that men and women think about sleep very differently. The final idea is that the mind thinks in images, and this is about imagination and metaphor and about the role that free association and projective techniques play in it. So metaphor, I think, is how our Big Bang, how our cosmological myth thinks about the imagination. And George Lakoff and Mark Johnson are kind of the gurus on metaphor. They wrote Philosophy in the Flesh. And I'll just quote them. They say, reason is not purely literal, but it's largely metaphorical and imaginative. And so I use free association and projective techniques to get into language that is like that. And so you can kind of get a sense of these things that are true about a category, like these things here. These are from Lakoff. The good is up. Happy's up. Conscious is up. When we wake up, wakefulness is up. And so I think every category kind of has these metaphors at work in them. The other thing I wanted to add here is this really heady title. This is a guy, Stephen Asma, is a professor of philosophy in Chicago. And he wrote a book called The Evolution of the Imagination. And he describes our modern view of the imagination. We view it kind of as a liability rather than a resource. And he's advocated for a new study of the imagination. He says the imagination is thinking with imagery, thinking with the body. And he calls imagination the mytho-poetic cognition built on an instinct for narrative, emotional meaning-making that sees the world primarily as a dramatic story of competing personal intentions rather than as a system of objective impersonal laws. 
It's all a little wordy, but I include him here because he's a unique character who's really building kind of a science around this idea of mythopoetic cognition, which I think is sort of beautiful and connects back to this idea of brands as myths. I want to tell you a little bit about the development process for this name and identity, the Palace Projects. Our client was the Digital Public Library of America, and they wanted to build the public alternative to Libby, which is the private front end. I don't know if you all know Libby. You can borrow audio books and eBooks from your public library using Libby. Libby is a private corporation. It's in Cleveland and it's essentially in 99% of public libraries. It's sort of like the digital front end of the public library system. It's kind of controlled by a private corporation. And my client wanted to build the only platform for libraries built by libraries. And that's what the Palace Project was. And we wanted to reclaim libraries as palaces for the people, which is how Carnegie described them to begin with. There's just a beautiful quote where he says that the libraries bestow nobility on all who enter, uh, especially those who need it most. So that's why we chose the palace as the name. I wrote about this, the development process for Epic, which is a business anthropology group. And in there, I kind of quote Asma and talk about this idea of including imagination in research and playfulness. And he's got some amazing ideas about how improvisation is the first act of imagination and central to imagination that we were evolved to playfully improvise using our imagination. Part of that process was using this. This is a screenshot of Round Robin, which was a digital space that was created for a performing arts group that we used to get 20 people in and free associate around the public library. Uh, digital reading. So this is a screenshot. If books have a magic power, what would it be? And so part of the this imaginative exercise generated imagery that informed the development of Palace and created permission for us to argue for the name Palace. Another story about the mind and thinking in images. This is from early in my career. I can't stop telling the story. We were hired by Clorox. I was living in San Francisco at the time. They had never really had any competition, but then store brands started to show up. So we did a brand audit on Bleach and to help them compete with the store brand. And we did focus groups. And the way I was taught to do focus groups is you never do personal introductions because it introduces a social hierarchy into the room. You have people write down answers to avoid one voice kind of dominating and because it makes people commit to their own ideas. And we would do, you know, a battery of free association questions. And one of them is always, if Clorox were an animal, what animal would it be? And to, to an alarming degree, a lot of these head of household women would mention a big female cat. Often it was a snow leopard because it's white and it's bleach. But I remember this one woman saying, I just saw, you know, I just saw a snow leopard it was like a mom snow leopard with like being really nurturing with some cubs. But if I got too close with it, it would rip my face off. <laughs> and we'd be like, well, what are you telling me about Clorox? And they'd say, well, I, you know, I love it because I use it to protect my family, but I'm afraid of it. You know what I mean? I keep it in the garage, keep it in the, with all the other chemical stuff. And this was late nineties. And so this informed a conversation that they already were having about creating products that had less bleach, and would allow them to get sort of on the countertop was their goal. And that was an image, a metaphor of the snow leopard. We built a whole brand platform around this idea that came out of the snow leopard, which was the nurturing the home ecosystem, I think was the language. I appreciate you listening to me for this long. Now I'm going to talk even more about the craft of interviewing. I'm nearing the end. I call this a traveler's guide to the awkward. Primarily because I think the awkward is like where we work or where I work. And it's this space between people where things get uncomfortable. And I think there are these moments when the script kind of falls away and we don't know what to do. And I, in those moments, often I want to flee and it gets very uncomfortable. So the more time we spend in the awkward, the better able we are to, to stay and learn. Because I think that's where everything beautiful happens. Um, and the etymology of the word awkward actually is turned the wrong way round. Awk and ward. Awk is turned around and word is the wrong way round. So the word itself kind of is at war with itself. I don't know if you know this, Marina Abramovich, she did this thing. The artist is present and anybody could sit and just hold eye contact with her. There was no communication. 
I don't think there was any limit. I think you could sit there for as long as you wanted. And uh, there was a photographer there who started a Tumblr. Marina Abramovich made me cry because a lot of people were, would be so overwhelmed by the encounter with another person that they would just cry. I've heard awkwardness described as a overwhelming self-consciousness. I think it's kind of something else. I think it's like an overwhelming other consciousness. I think we're just blown away by what we're encountering in the other person once everything is stripped away and it just becomes too much. And this is just a way of really honoring, I think, just the magic of being alive. I'm mixing metaphors like crazy, but I've given parts of this presentation under the title, The Archaeology of the Awkward because I can't get this image out of my mind of the brushing of the skeleton, that there's somehow the scale of the skeleton and the delicacy of the brush. I think about maybe the brush is questions and the skeleton is maybe a memory and just being so careful to, to not be too forceful and to sort of respect the thing that I'm, I'm asking about. This is from an essay that Ursula Le Guin wrote called Listening is Telling. I can't recommend it more highly. It includes these diagrams. This is what she says the dominant image of communication that we have is. And where I'm a box, you're a box, we use language to transmit information through the tube and I can be the speaker and then we can take turns and you can be the speaker and it's all information. But... She says, human communication cannot be reduced to information. The message not only involves, but it is a relationship between the speaker. And so what she proposes is an intersubjective model, which is amoeba sex. Two amoebas, this is her, two amoebas having sex or two people talking form a community of two. And people are also able to form communities of many through sending and receiving bits of ourselves and others back and forth continually through, in other words, talking and listening. So talking and listening are ultimately the same thing. And I just love that. And I think about conversation as a place. So this, again, this like there's something happens, we get to a place with somebody else. There's a quote from, I think it's the guy who founded Appreciative Inquiry. I don't know if you've ever encountered Appreciative Inquiry. David Cooper Ryder, he says, we live in the world our questions create. I think Asking questions can be scary because we feel like what people say is their final answer. And I think what I've learned is that no, nothing anybody says is their final answer. There's always something to, to express curiosity about or to ask into and to keep open. I was taught never to ask why because it puts people on the defensive and it assumes a rational explanation. So I will always start questions with what or how, or I'll use their own language. I'll just play their own language back to them. The only time I will ask why is when I'm done with a topic and, and I want to know what position might they take? You know, how would they actually defend that decision? Because they're unlikely to change that position. I've had that experience where I've asked why and then wanted to time travel back to before I made them take a position and it doesn't work. <laughs> So this is the end of my talk. I'm returning to Campbell a little bit, this idea of connecting the individual interview to culture. How do we hear culture in an interview? This is Campbell. He says, the rise and fall of civilizations can be seen to have been a function of the integrity of the myth for not authority, but it is aspiration is the motivator and builder and transformer of civilization. So if we can understand how people what people are aspiring to, then we can start to help our clients build beautiful brands. And that is, that is the whole thing. And again, I really I appreciate you giving me the opportunity to play around with these ideas and certainly for listening to them for this long. Awesome. Thank you so much. I loved that talk. I really did. And that's the second time I heard that one. And I really love it. <laughs> the team has been going crazy in Slack with questions and ideas. So I'll open it up to you guys. Yeah. Hey, Peter, it seems to me just that I've been thinking things I've been thinking about that brands are really supplanting our traditional sense making institutions. So religion, science, work, really taking a much more foundational role in how we construct our self narratives and even our personhood. So I just would be curious how you react to that. 
thesis and maybe why you agree or disagree and why you think if you agree that might be happening right now? I love it. I mean, I love the question and the observation. I agree with it entirely. And it returns me to the piece about the times. I spent a lot of time working. A friend of mine was at the Knight Foundation. And so I was a brand consultant for grantees. And they were, you know, civic innovators who were getting money from Knight Foundation to build community and do wonderful civic projects. Um, But these individuals were allergic to the idea of brand. And so I think one of the reasons what you're describing is happening is that those sense-making institutions did not want to participate in culture because they did not think it was part of their remit. They just thought culture's over there, we're over here. We don't have to, we don't have to do it. I mean, I'd love to hear how you guys feel about that, but that's my sense that they kind of assumed they were sense-making authorities and they didn't have to defend it. They weren't in the phone booth. They weren't in the knife fight. Yeah. It seems like maybe they were slow to react to the breakdown of old systems of expertise, right? So that that signaled to them that, hey, we're still playing under this regime of expertise so we can afford to sit on the sidelines of culture where really what was happening was, you know, the, the rules of the game were changing. Sounds yes. like that's what you're saying. Absolutely. Better, much, well, much better said than me. But yeah, absolutely. I had a question in regards to myth making. Currently in the mental health space, there are new startups that focus on quote unquote like self-therapy or choosing your own journey. In that particular circumstance, how important is it that users have a myth to follow or as opposed to creating one for themselves? Can you tell me a little bit more about, maybe give me an example of the... Yeah. So the the startup that I'm thinking of focuses on you creating your own journey towards your mental health. So it's a very, without sort of like a therapist, like in-person therapist, not talking to someone, it's more so within an app, you get to journal yourself and sort of discover yourself on your own. I believe there's also like a metaverse type game where in which you can explore your own world in a way that allows you to discover yourself from a gamified standpoint. And so I guess in that context, what is like a brand's role? Like, is it their job to create that myth for them, to guide them in that way? Or like, how was it, how important is it to, for them to create it themselves? I think you, 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 you've been saying it all along, the self-discovery, the brand's responsibility. Eat Big Fish, they talk about how building a lighthouse identity. So the brand's responsibility is to be a beacon for this promise of self-discovery, to make sure that every interaction that people have makes that promise. And then I suppose it's the product experience that's meant to deliver on that promise through all the different technologies. I mean, that sounds like what you're describing actually is a new mythic narrative for therapy built in the contemporary science and technology of the day. Why have a human therapist who's gone and gotten a PhD when we can gamify it? And so that's exactly it. I did work for Weight Watchers and there's there's echoes there with the accountability that they tried to build into the system. And it, but it's a question with that stuff, but there's real outcomes at stake. You either lose weight or you don't. You either feel better or you don't. Thank you. Thank you. So your insight with bleach is really interesting about how people maybe thought it was a snow leopard and they were kind of scared of it. And that kind of translated into what they did with the brand. But I was wondering if you had another really interesting insight like that and then how you kind of got there, how you got to that insight. Yeah. I love these stories so much. This project I just did for Lundberg Family Farms, they're a premium rice company. They grow everything in America. Their practices are impeccable, regenerative, sustainable. I mean, they're like a model of how it's meant to be done, but people don't pay for premium rice. We pay up for Justin's peanut butter, but we don't pay up for rice. And so the question really was, how do we, what is premium rice? And I did the same questions. And so there's one interview that I remember that I'm going to tell you about. It was a man. He was a new father. I don't know if that played into his exhaustion, but the animal that he came up with was a zebra. He said, I want to write, if rice were an animal, he says, I guess it's a zebra. And I was like, well, tell me about the zebra. And he said, I was told that there's two types of zebras. There's black zebras with white stripes and there's white zebras with black stripes. And uh, he was legitimately confused. He was really expressing a total confusion about what a zebra is and what it connected to all these other moments when I talk to people about rice. When you ask people about rice, they talk about culture. They have no idea how it's grown in America. We don't know what it looks like. We don't know how people how it's farmed. 
So the whole agricultural practice of rice in America is totally, they don't have a mental conception of it, which means that every, all the communication around organic and regenerative and sustainable has nowhere to land. And so they're not getting any credit. And again, so that came from this, you know, it sounds crazy to talk about a zebra, you know what I mean? And then connect that to business, but it, it happens and it's magic. Is that what you were sort of asking about? Yeah, thank you. That was interesting. That actually leads to my question. I feel like everybody has a few of those aces in their back pocket. Like the questions that they know always lead somewhere interesting or most of the time, like reliably. If you're willing to share, I would love to hear some of your favorites that you use in rotation. So let's see. So there's definitely, if it were an animal, it's like it's in my sleep. You know what I mean? If it were an animal, if it were a day of the week, I have a whole bunch of projective techniques. The animal one always feels like it works. If it had a magic power to transform things, what would it be? It would make things more what? That one's always helpful. I'm sort of drawing a blank at the moment. The thing that comes to mind is getting comfortable asking people how they feel. Um, I feel like it's always okay and it's always somehow productive to be like, I get really comfortable to being really naive and be like, what's that like? Like, what does that feel like? And to just push a little bit further into, gosh, what's, what was that like? You know what I mean? And to be really curious about it. I feel like that's probably, um, that's the thing that came to mind initially, just that really sincere curiosity because they don't know either. Cause you're, they, it's not like that answer is sitting there waiting for somebody to ask it. You, we, you make them, you push them into this territory where they have to generate these, this language. I think that being comfortable pushing and stepping in with kind of with love, I think is probably what I would say. I'm very curious, you know, with brands, I feel like there's often, you have two options. You can create a new myth or you can kind of lead the, the existing myth story. You have to kind of respond to that. And obviously we're seeing a lot of new myths being created at a seemingly aggressive pace. What are the signals? What are the signs that there is appetite and openness to a new myth or there is a need for a new myth? Oh, wow. Oh, that's such an interesting question. I don't know how to answer that question. That's such a beautiful question. The first thing that comes to mind is sort of Grant's, what Cam, what Joseph Campbell, what Grant McCracken both describe is just a landscape of propositions that are completely disconnected. You know what I mean? What Grant describes is that myths are all, it's just a natural, it's always going to happen. It's just going to happen. What's the sign? Actually, what's the sign that new myths are going to happen? People are growing up. You know, people are having children. Young people are separating, are defying their parents. You know, he really talks about in the gravity well effect. He talks about how these little pockets of order show up in between all the categories. So whatever categories were there before, they get re, they get remixed and rethought, and it's just evolution. It's like I think I've I've read pieces where people compare cultural evolution to biological evolution. It's just sort of a it's a force of nature, right? I've got a follow up there. I'm curious, something else I've been thinking about is we could take Maslow's hierarchy as like a crude approximation, like at any given time in our cultural, social history, any given moment, there are different areas, different needs that are most psychologically pressing, right? Because of like the, the changing of the time. So, you know, maybe connected to John Louis' question about maybe when you know you need to create a new myth, what do you see right now as either the emerging or the most salient unmet psychological need? that's kind of new, that's coming new into focus versus ones, ones in the past. I feel like all the myths are crumbling. It's not like Grant's piece is not, it's bleak. You know what I mean? Like these institutions, he said the, con the consequences are terrifying, you know? And I think this is the picture that Joseph Campbell paints too, that we're kind of living in the wreckage of sense-making institutions and we're having to figure it out and, and it's not going well. You know, it's not going well. So I don't know. I don't know. That's the answer that came to me in response. I, I have my own sort of, yeah, I, I don't know. I just think we, we got to figure out. I think we need a new myth. I mean, that's the thing. Who's going to do it? And it's not, does it, does everything have to kind of crumble for a new myth to kind of show up? I don't know, but I, and I have no idea. I have a follow-up to that question. How hard or easy is it for brands to change myths and maintain their integrity? Well, two things are true. One is that a brand has to change all the time. That brand is a constant, it's in constant 
evolution, right? And so that's what innovation is that job to make sure that the product connects to the shifts in culture and delivers on the brand and all that stuff. So that managing that sort of system of change is the, is the work, I think. So it has to be changing. And, and that's a lot, that's a lot of work. There's, that's why there's not, I don't think there's a, there a lot of really good examples. I mean, the Gatorade example, I don't even know how great, that was a great rebrand, but were they able to sustain it? I'm not sure how they're doing these days. It's hard. It's hard to do. Definitely. And it's expensive. It's, it's takes, it costs a lot of money. Myth works because we participate in it. And it seems a lot of brands are moving towards more communities and, you know, that like a much more engaged conversation that they're having. I'm kind of curious your thoughts about this and how much a community is required to build and maintain a myth and to kind of establish it versus, you know, a brand that does it in a vacuum. Does that, is that even possible? I'm just kind of curious what your thought is of the requirement to have engagement and organic interest in that for a myth to succeed. Yeah. I mean, maybe this connects back to the previous question. What came to me was this line that my first company would say that we consume what we're afraid we're losing. And this idea that there's something complementary in brand, that that's a role that brand plays. It sort of mirrors us a little bit. It gives us what we're afraid we're losing. And so maybe the growth of community is as much about what we need as it is about what the, you know, what it means to be a brand. But somehow it's a conspiracy, you know what I mean? That we're, it's co-created, I guess, in that way. So you talked about, you know, Gatorade and you're not sure how they're doing right now. And you've done this for a long time. So, you know, brands will rebrand, but is there something that's kind of stuck in your career that you wish that brands better understood about UNs in general? Oh my God. I mean, I wish they understood this. I feel like I spent my whole career in face-to-face -face conversation with people, exploring the relationship that we have with the products and the meaning that we wrap around it and how real that is. And I wish more people took that seriously, you know, honestly, that we, we treated it better. I mean, I think Airbnb is sort of beautiful. They're like honoring the relationship that we have, the meaning, you know, it seems to me. Um, and I wish others kind of invested it or honored that as much, you know, and didn't treat it like a, I would say of, you know, fear the gerund of branding. You know what I mean? Like I think branding overwhelmed brand, which is this relationship. So yeah, that would be nice, especially like the New York Times and some of the institutions, the sense-making institutions, I wish they had assumed responsibility. The CEO of the Space Doctors, do you know them? Fiona McNay, I think it's her name. She gave a TED Talk. I quote her all the time because she talks about, she's, they do semiotics and she talks about taking responsibility for being understood. And I think that's like the whole thing. It's really sort of beautiful. I wish people, I wish they took responsibility for being understood, which means asking people, what does that mean? I love clarifying quotes like that. It's very powerful when you say it like that. We have kind of a shared belief at Concept Bureau that it's easy and natural to predict the next negative thing that's going to happen in the future, but it's much harder to predict the optimistic or positive thing. And throughout history, it is the unexpected optimistic thing that usually wins and moves culture forward. What is something optimistic you're seeing either in culture or behaviors or identity or the world or branding even that stands out for you? I, mean, I love the question. And it reminds me of appreciative inquiry, which is, did you know anything about that? Mm. So that was a practice. I don't know enough. I, I know just enough to be dangerous, but it was, it's a organizational transformation approach born in the eighties. That was basically the diagnosis was that every effort to change usually, and I think this is, I'm echoing everything you just said, is you identify the problem and you solve it. And so this problem solution, and then you just end up moving the problem around. And so what happens is that you just start putting out fires. And so problem, solution, problem, solution, problem, solution. And what appreciative inquiry does is instead ask, what's the peak experience? What's the best, when things went absolutely beautiful, what, what were the conditions that produced the beauty? Let's reproduce the positive conditions that produced our peak of performance as opposed to going in this negative frame. So I think that is one thought that I have. 
And then the other one is I was in a conversation with, I guess there's a McLuhan has this question about new technologies and it says, you can ask it, you ask the technology, what does it retrieve or what does it recover? And what does it obsolesce? And, and I was in a conversation about what chat GPT recovers and obsolesces. And what was optimistic about it was that it's text, it's language. And so this whole conversation about qualitative being taken seriously, um, they're not dealing in numbers, right? We're dealing in words. So this is qualitative. So there's something qualitative about chat GPT that maybe is kind of a Trojan horse for, you know, it's going to get on leadership's desk. You know what I mean? And it's, it's so that's one piece of optimism. I love that. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you for the question. That's really interesting. Sometimes when you're interviewing people, they kind of have a good mental model of what you're discussing. And sometimes they really don't. They've never given it any thought. They don't have a mental map of the territory. They don't know how to describe anything. And it's especially, you know, I, I feel like in B2B, for example, you see that a little bit more in terms of like, when it's a consumer, I know my personal experience, but in a business environment, I think less about those things. And so I'm wondering, how do you deal with, trying to understand the experience, trying to gain insight when you're interviewing someone that has very low awareness of the, what you're discussing. I, I, you, I think you've touched on some themes and tools here, but I wonder if you could speak a little bit more to that when there's a very specifically a very low awareness for the interviewee. One answer is there's a recruiting issue. If I'm talking to somebody and they don't, I guess for me, if I'm interviewing somebody, I want somebody who has experience. I want, I'm, talk, I'm trying to interview them about an experience that they've had. Mm -hmm. If they haven't had that experience, then I, I don't have anything for them. So maybe there's one way of asking the question that sort of it's a recruiting thing. And then the other one, the other way, the other answer is, I guess there's three answers. Maybe it's a recruiting issue. Second answer, maybe you can't do it. Just say goodbye, you know, because there's nothing there. And then the third one is to build on the optimism thing is to um, believe that they can do it. And to, you know, to trust that they can do it. And I've had that where people, they don't want to do it, you know, and especially with the free association stuff, it makes people uncomfortable. Yeah. But I feel like it's a little bit of that. I I believe that they can do it. And I learned, and that was something I was taught too, that everybody's creative, you know, we're all creative. The consumption that we go through, that's a creative act. I remember, you know, people ask like, oh, we need to talk to creative consumers. That's from by that's horseshit for me. I think everybody is a creative individual who's living their lives imaginatively. It's just our responsibility to get them there or make them feel comfortable enough to explore it. But it doesn't definitely, I mean, I, I abandon interviews all the time because it doesn't work. I have another question, which is on the complete opposite end of the spectrum, which is, you know, this, this conversation about myth, I think is very interesting. I love your intro when there's the four different levels, mm -hmm. you know, you go from the cosmological to the psychological. I'm really curious, you know, Rebecca mentioned something about self-discovery brands, which is very much about the individual. And Zach mentioned about how, you know, brands are replacing religion to some extent. And so you've got these many different altitudes of myth. I'm kind of curious if you have a sense or just in your experience, there is a trend towards myths that are more smaller towards the individual or myths that are much larger towards the more sort of cosmological and almost spiritual. And I'm kind of curious as, you know, we go through rounds and rounds of new myths, are they getting bigger or smaller or, or are they are they changing at all in, in terms of scale and size? Yeah, well, that's awesome. That's a beautiful question. The first thing I think is, I think that the conversation around brand purpose, which I call social mission, I think that's relatively new in the last 15 years or something like that. So in that way, I think brands have gotten bigger and that we're talking about social issues and that conversation. That's not a, that's not a novel observation. So in one respect, they've gotten bigger. And I think there's, I mean, I did a project for Mega Food, which is a supplements brand with young people. And so I feel like certainly, I mean, in the earlier version of this presentation, Goop was in the cosmological section, right? So I think brands are, I think maybe brands have always been playing at these different levels, maybe. And it's just, it would be hard to say whether it's gotten bigger or more, bigger or less. But I think Goop is playing up at that level, like Bitcoin, or crypto. I don't know. What do you think? I don't, I don't know. 
it kind of feels to me like a, an expanding universe and that every pocket is getting bigger and there's just more in every bucket. To your point, I think you just see a lot more myths, I think is, is the answer rather than at, at every level, essentially. That, I think that's what I've observed at least. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And I think brand builders are more sophisticated, you know, like the, you know, people picking up the tools of brand building are more comfortable pushing into these places that were there before. I'm thinking about Goop and all the brands that are that are playing in the the you know spiritual the spirit the brands that are talking about spirituality these days is that wasn't happening when I was coming up. So kind of key to you know doing qualitative interviews, as a lot of us know, is empathy. So how do you think that people and really qualitative researchers can better practice empathy? So my favorite definition of empathy is from Roman Kazarik, who is from the School of Life. Do you know him at all? He just finds it as the imaginative leap into the perspective of another. So I really think it's just practice. I mean, it's really just encountering everybody that you meet and trying to be present with them and ask them questions and just empathize, honestly. Yeah, it feels like it's really, it's practice. And then, I mean, yeah, sorry, I'm just going to keep saying the same thing. I'm, I'm flashing back to my, you know, in the beginning, I was a young, I was a, a young man. I had no idea what I was doing. <laughs> you know what I mean? It was no gift. It was just I got, I just got a lot of, a lot of chances to try to understand people. And this is something I say too. I'm so grateful that I ended up with this work because it made me a better person to have been forced to sit down across from somebody as a young American man to try to understand what they're thinking. Man, so grateful. I got maybe maybe right next to this empathy question. Sometimes you come across people whose beliefs say one thing, but their actions say another. There's a real dichotomy there, maybe lying to themselves or, you know, there's, there's a tension within. What does that tell you as a researcher when you hear the, this kind of internal conflict? What, what can you glean from that kind of a scenario? Well, it's that paradox is human. And so we all contradict ourselves all the time. So it totally makes sense. Like to expect consistency is unnatural. So the first thought that comes to mind is caution. You know what I mean? Because I want to make them feel safe and heard, right? I don't want to be showing them their inconsistency and make them feel judged. I've been there. I've done that. And it's, it feels horrible because it's hurtful <laughs> in a way because you're show, you're like, you're kind of judging them a little bit. And uh, this guy... Again, I, I return to therapy. Carl Rogers, he talks about unconditional positive regard. And so I'm so maybe one thing to practice empathy is to practice being, you know, just not registering. They call it face work. We do all this natural face work. We're communicating with our face all the time. So one of the things to practice empathy is to practice not showing your feet, your reaction is one side which is less romantic, you know, like the first tip and being a good listener is pretending you're listening. <laughs> but yeah, no, I think, I think we're all inconsistent and we, none of us are coherent really. And just to, to be gentle, I guess. Excellent. Thank you. I've got one last question. That's, that's a softball. It's a question nice. that every human being just loves to be asked. So you mentioned Carl, Carl Rogers and Joseph Campbell Beyond those two, who are some of like the influences that are near and dear to your heart that have like really informed your work? You know, these could be therapists, musicians, artists, thinkers, you know, anybody. Huh. Yeah. I feel like I really kind of emptied the bucket here with Lakoff and Stephen Asma and Harlene Anderson. Yeah, nothing else is coming. I'll think about it though. I'll be like, oh man, what about you? What would what would you say? I'm sociologist by background, so definitely like Emil Durkheim, which, you know, he's a huge influence on Graham McCracken and yeah. and even even Joseph Campbell, just the, you know, the group solidarity and how myth binds groups together and how like chaos is the enemy. We need order. You know, that that way of thinking really originated there. And then yeah. obviously the existentialists in philosophy like Simone de Beauvoir and and Sartre and just again, how do we control chaos when we can be anything we want? How do we make order and meaning out of chaos. Like, I think, yeah. I think anybody that addresses that question for me personally yeah. is. All right. So you've just triggered it. And I'm, cause I'm just going there. Jeffrey Kripal, does that name ring a bell? 
Uh-huh. So he's a humanities, he's a comparative religions professor at Rice University. And he's basically been writing books about paranormal experiences as being modern mystical experiences. And he is unbelievable. And he's an advocate for the humanities. And he says, why do we let physicists run around talking about string theory? And we humanities who our job is to study culture, which he calls consciousness encoded, right? Why do we, why are we letting the physicists have all the fun? We have got a long history of recorded experiences that are mystical in nature, and we don't talk about them. He just had the first sort of convention of paranormal experiences at Rice. He wrote a book called The Flip, which Michael Pollan referenced in one of his top five books. And I think he's awesome. And bonus award, one of his books is about how a lot of the comic books authors all had mystical experiences, mutants and mystics. And so the science fiction and the superheroes and all this stuff is wrapped up in this tradition of mystical experiences. And he's the, he wrote a history of Esalen, the first long history of Esalen and the center of the New Age movement, the human potential movement, and is on the board there at Esalen. So he gets me fired up. I think, that, I think what he's talking about is awesome. Love it. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look into him. That sounds great. Nice. Thank you for that question. Peter, I cannot thank you enough. I oh, really- man. Such a thoughtful presentation, and I know the team loved it. I loved it, and I think you've set a really good tone for Toxic Concept Bureau. And I just want to thank you again. Like I said, man, it just—I really you gave me permission to explore stuff and have some fun, and I really, I'm so I really appreciate it, and I'm glad I'm glad you also enjoyed it. Mm-hmm.